system of the middle way. Nagarjuna's Mulamadhyaya Makarika. Translation and Commentary by J. L. Garfield. Part 2, The Text and Commentary. Chapter 20, Examination of Combination. This chapter examines the possibility that, while no effect could be inherently dependent upon any single cause, it might be that the correct understanding of dependent arising and the thoroughgoing interdependence of phenomena that Nagarjuna urges involves the inherent dependence of any phenomenon on the combination of all of its conditions. Thus, while every phenomenon would, as Nagarjuna has been arguing, be completely dependent on all others, this dependence itself would be inherently existent. Much of the argument is a reprise of arguments that we have seen already, particularly in chapters 1 and 7. But the temporal analysis of chapter 19 is also in evidence. 1. If, arising from the combination of causes and conditions, the effect is in the combination. How could it arise from the combination? 2. If, arising from the combination of causes and conditions, the effect is not in the combination. How could it arise from the combination? In the opening verses, Nagarjuna sets up the destructive dilemma that frames the first part of this chapter, either the effect is already present in the combination on which it is supposed by the reificationist to inherently depend or it is not. If it is, he will argue, there is no sense in which it really arises from them at all. If not, on the other hand, he will argue that there is no sense in which whatever dependence there is could be inherent dependence. Nagarjuna alternates in the subsequent verses between these alternatives, developing a number of difficulties for each. 3. If the effect is in the combination of causes and conditions, then it should be grasped in the combination. But it is not grasped in the combination. First, suppose that the effect already exists somehow in the combination of phenomena on which it depends. Then in grasping that is, in conceiving or perceiving that collection, we should, ipso facto, grasp the effect. But we do not. Consider the set of conditions of a match lighting. There is the presence of sulfur, friction, oxygen, and so forth. But neither in virtue of conceiving of these things nor in virtue of seeing them do we see fire. 4. If the effect is not in the combination of causes and conditions, then actual causes and conditions would be like non-causes and non-conditions. On the other hand, Nagarjuna argues, if the proponent of inherently existent dependence argues that the effect is not present in the combination, he would have to say that there is no difference between actual conditions of an effect and an arbitrary collection of phenomena with no relation at all to it. Because the very point of this analysis is to explain how a particular set of conditions determines an effect. For Nagarjuna, as we should be able to see by recalling his treatment of dependent origination and the relation between conditions and their effects in Chapter 1, this is no problem, there is simply no general metaphysical answer to such a question for a Madhyamaka philosopher. A collection of conditions determines its effect simply because when those conditions are present, that effect arises. That fact may in turn be empirically explicable by other regularities. But there is no independent foundation for the network of regularities itself. However, for the substantialist there must be some analysis of the collection of conditions itself that answers the question regarding how that collection has the power to produce that effect. And the answer the opponent proposes is that it does so because the effect is inherently present in some sense in that collection. 5. If the cause, in having its effect, ceased to have its causal status, there would be two kinds of cause, with and without causal status. At this point, Nagarjuna turns to the temporal relation between the effect, the cause, and the combination of conditions that together with the primary cause of the effect bring about the effect. The position that he is worrying about is this, effects depend upon particular causes, but those causes need the cooperation of supporting conditions in order to be efficacious. The familiar example in this context is that of the seed and the sprout. The seed, according to the proponent of such a position, causes the sprout, but only if there is soil, water, air, and so forth, to support it. Nagarjuna then complains that on this view the word, cause, is being used equivocally, 
in one sense it is used to refer to things the primary causes that really don't cause anything. In the other sense, it is used to refer to those that really have causal status namely, the entire assemblage of conditions that are necessary and sufficient for the arising of the effect. 6. If the cause, not yet having produced its effect, ceased. Then having arisen from a ceased cause, the effect would be without a cause. But, he urges, if we want to assert that the cause, instead of changing from a cause to a non-cause, simply ceases at the moment when it produces its effect, we still have a problem. Because by the time the effect emerges, the cause will have vanished, and the effect will then have emerged without a cause and so will be a causeless effect. 7. If the effect were to arise simultaneously with the collection, then the produced and the producer would arise simultaneously. Turning now to the entire collection as determinative of the effect, Nagarjuna points out that the effect cannot be simultaneous with the occurrence of a collection of its conditions for all of the reasons that he has advanced previously against the simultaneity of causes and their effects. 8. If the effect were to arise prior to the combination. Then, without causes and conditions, the effect would arise causelessly. But neither, of course, can the effect arise before the conditions are met since the effect would then arise spontaneously, and this possibility has been refuted earlier. 9. If, the cause having ceased, the effect were a complete transformation of the cause, then a previously arisen cause would arise again. Nagarjuna now responds to the following possible reply, the effect in question is not an entity distinct from the cause or the collection of conditions that serve as its ground. Therefore these questions about the temporal relations between events involving distinct entities do not arise. The sprout is not distinct from the seed, but is merely a complete transformation of it. But, Nagarjuna argues, it is also not possible to characterize the effect as a simple change of nature of a single entity that was the cause before the transformation. For then we would have to say that the cause remains in existence after the effect arises and so would have to keep producing the same effect over and over again. This argument might seem not to have much bite. After all, one might think, the alternative being proposed seems quite like Nagarjuna's own view that we should not think of causes and their effects as distinct entities. But this would be wrong. This argument succeeds because the opponent denies the distinctness in entity between cause and effect by positing an identity in essence and by appealing to that essence to explain the causal potential of the cause. If the essence of the entity is what determines its causal potential, then if that essence remains, the potential should remain as well. If the essence does not remain, then the language of transformation must be abandoned. If the essence remains, and the language of transformation is retained at an accidental level, the claim that there is an essential causal principle must be rejected. 10. How can a cause, having ceased and dissolved, give rise to a produced effect? How can a cause joined with its effect produce it if they persist together? 